that there is a, uh, a, a forum, a discussion session late this afternoon at the uh, conclusion of this program. Can I also remind you to turn your phones off? I should have done that. I forgot to turn my own phone off. And uh, many of you have already identified the, uh, uh, the toilets um, out to the left here, or my left, your right, so uh, feel free to use them if you see the need. Okay, our next presenter um, is Mike Goddard. Mike Goddard is a, I think that's right, isn't it? It is Mike Goddard. Oh, good, good, good. People were just looking at me blankly. I thought I've made enough mistake. Mike Goddard is a professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Mike is probably most well known for his uh, genetic research on farm animals. But I might add that uh, Mike's PhD was on uh, developing a breeding program for guide dogs. Um, so Mike has a strong interest in the genetics of uh, companion animals. And I also noticed that uh, Mike Goddard's PhD supervisor, uh, Dr Rolf Bolhartz, is sitting in the audience. So uh, welcome, Rolf. Mike, call on you before I continue on. Thank you very much and uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Um, when I showed uh, my dogs this uh, flyer for the, uh, the conference today, they were mortified that uh, other people's dogs got their pictures on the, uh, on the paper and they didn't. So I, I promised them that I would, uh, would show the, their picture. <laughs> Okay, so what are the steps in setting up a breeding program? And this doesn't matter whether it's for cattle or for dogs uh, or for anything else. You go through the same steps. So this is something we know how to do. The first thing is that you have to decide on what your breeding objectives are. That is, what traits would you actually want to improve that would give you, in our case, a better dog? Having decided what traits you want to improve, what do we know about the genetics of those traits? And then using that information, design a breeding program. And I'll go through those, those three steps. So what are our breeding objectives? What traits do we actually want to improve? Well, it obviously depends upon the use for which the dogs will be put. Um, and let's face it, the vast majority of dogs today are pets. And we've already had a discussion about what pet owners want and what they need. And I think I'm agreeing with the previous two speakers. We want dogs that are healthy. We want dogs that have low levels of fearfulness, low aggression, and low excitability. And then there are individual traits that individual owners want. Some people want a dog that doesn't shed, for example. Uh, these traits are actually very much the same traits that most working dogs require. And this gives us a bit more objective information on why dogs fail. Uh, many years ago now, I did a PhD on breeding guide dogs, and uh, these were the reasons for failure in percentages. 27% of the Royal Guide Dogs for Blind Association own puppies were rejected for fearfulness and 44% of the donated puppies they got were rejected for fearfulness. And so on the other things for which they got rejected, uh, excitability, dog distraction, hip dysplasia, aggression, these are all the usual things that are problems with dogs, whether we're talking about guide dogs or sniffer dogs or pet dogs, it tends to be the same range of traits. So, what do we know about the genetics of these traits? Um, well, what possibilities are there for improving them? How would we go about improving them? There's essentially three things we can do. We can choose which breed to, to have, we can consider crossbreeding, and we can do selection within whatever breed it is. So 
So what knowledge do we need to, uh, to be able to make good decisions in those three areas? Well, obviously, if you're deciding which breed to keep, you need information about the differences between breeds. That's so trivial, why do I even tell you? The funny thing is, it's very difficult to get objective information on breed differences. Everybody's got their own opinion, uh, and Pauline showed a, a random sample of the population's opinion about what breeds are, uh, are, are good for different things. Um, my wife, many years ago, said she wanted dogs that were really sooky and submissive and didn't bark. And I said, you want a golden retriever. <laughs> she didn't know that, but I did. Um, when considering crossbreeding, the important thing there is whether there's any benefit in crossbreds. Are crossbreds better on average than purebreds? That's a phenomenon geneticists call hybrid vigour. And for selection within breeds, we need to know whether the traits we're interested in are controlled by single genes, like coat colour, or if they're controlled by many genes, as they usually are, how heritable those traits are. So I'll go through those different things. Uh, some of the traits we're interested in are controlled by a single gene. Uh, yellow versus black coat colour in Labradors is an example. Every animal has got two copies of this E gene, one from mum and one from dad. If you've got two copies of the big E gene, you're black. If you've got two copies of the little E gene, you're yellow. And if you've got one copy of each, you're still black. And so we say that black is dominant or yellow is recessive in this particular gene. Sometimes neither is recessive. Sometimes the, the animal that's got one copy of each gene is sort of in between the other two. Uh, this is an example of a mutation in a, a gene called myostatin. It's a double muscling gene. And the, where are we? This animal is a normal whippet. This animal has got one copy of the normal gene and one copy of the mutant and they're very muscular dogs. This animal has got two copies of the mutant gene and it is really bulked up. It's to the point of being pathological. But these ones are actually uh, quite good at racing because they're reasonably normal but with more, with more muscle. So this is an example where the, the animal that's got one copy of each gene is part way in between and it's also an example where you, you don't want to select these animals because once you start breeding them together you'll get those. So for some genetic abnormalities they're controlled by a single gene. Uh, progressive retinal atrophy as it uh, used to occur in Irish setters and still occurs in various breeds is an example of this. The, the normal animals have got two copies of the normal gene. In order to have PRA, you have to get two copies of the mutant gene, one from mum and one from dad, and then you, you go blind. It's night blindness. The animals who've got one copy of the normal and one copy of the mutant gene look OK. They don't go blind, but they're carriers. They pass that mutant gene on to their offspring. So how can we control these single gene abnormalities? Well, obviously you don't breed from affected dogs. Uh, but preferably you don't breed from carriers. The problem is, for many genes, you can't tell that the animal is a carrier. They look all right. If they've produced an affected puppy, then you know they're a carrier, but you know that's too late in a way. For some abnormalities now, there's a DNA test and you can test a dog to see if there's a carrier. And you could either cull carriers, not breed from them, or at the very least not make carriers together. 